an extremely intimate crowd uh, for this talk on the quantified self, uh, a kind of movement that's grown up um, since the proliferation of kind of mobile smartphone technology and apps, of course. So uh, I'm James Carson. I'm a content strategy consultant. Um, I currently work at Factory Media as acting head of digital content. Um, Factory Media publish about 30 titles across uh, digital and print in action sports. And it's really through that that kind of tickled my interest in the quantified self because I found, uh, particularly working in bike sports um, like Dirt, uh, Dirt Mountain Bike Magazine and RC UK, a road cycling website, that many, many people were using kind of Strava and self-quantification apps to kind of measure themselves. And it's really becoming quite a big thing. And we're kind of at a coming of age moment with, with it. And I think there's much more to come. So. Uh, just with a definition of what the quantified self is, and this is from Ben Hammersley, who's the government advisor to Tech City. So it's the habit of using technology to measure something in your life in order to be able to pay more attention to it, and then from that to be able to share that data that's created and share that attention amongst other like-minded people in order to find some wider correlation, some wider causality behind whatever that thing is. And uh, just to break that quote down, because it's pretty meaty, it's basically using an app on your mobile uh, to measure something about your life so that you might improve upon it. Um, so, just going to start with a simple one. Uh, how many steps have you walked today? Does anybody know in the audience? Do you know? Would you like to hazard a guess? Yeah? So, 2059 there. Uh, anyone else guesses over here? It's probably going to be about the same. Uh, the average is actually 3,000 to 4,000, and uh, the NHS recommends that it's 10,000. Uh, so we're only at about 30 to 40 percent of uh, what we really should be doing, according to the NHS. And then yesterday I made uh, 6,432, which was uh, a pretty good day. Uh, just before I bed, may maybe I should have stamped down a couple more times, um, but uh, not quite the 10,000. And through this, through this measurement, you know. I can kind of optimize my life and, and go towards that goal of 10,000 every day. So the obvious way to do this in the kind of classic way is to use a pedometer. It's kind of the most basic um, quantification app. This is a piece of hardware, obviously. It's 53 pence on Amazon. Um, it measures how many steps, how many miles, how many kilometers you've walked in a day. But of course, now we have smartphone technology. Um, it's become, the quantified self kind of application has become very well integrated into that. And now we've got wearable technology like like fuel bands, uh, Fitbits, and Apple uh, are rumored to have patented um, a watch. Uh, so watch this space on Apple's front. And of course, on top of this hardware, we've kind of built up um, loads of different apps. And so all of these apps kind of do li have little differences. So uh, Nike Plus, obviously, really good integration with Nike products and running shoes. MyFitnessPal is a calorie counter around um, eating, <laughs> obviously. And then Photography is a gamified community for um, basically keeping fit, it's a gamified website. And when I was kind of looking through these apps, I really wanted to find something that suited what I was doing, and I found quite a lot of them quite difficult to set up, or you have to be quite involved in the actual, uh, in a certain sport. Like Strava, for instance, is a bit pointless to do unless you're a very regular runner or a cyclist. So um, I picked Endomondo because it's a really quite simple app. Uh, you basically time yourself when you're gone from work, when you're leaving from work to work, and I said, I'm cycling, and it tells me all sorts of data about myself. So on this slide here, uh, that's just an example of the Endomondo interface. It's not mine. But uh, over a two-week period, I cycled every day from uh, Clapham Junction to Farringdon. Um, I found that my average time was 32.25. And there's actually a massive fluctuation between my best times and my worst times. And so you know, if I was maybe hungover one day or... Uh, there was a lot of traffic, then um, my worst in the period was 41.25. And my best time, you know, if I was really going for it and I, you know, didn't have any, I wasn't feeling tired or anything like that, was 25.41. So you normally get up in the morning and, and leave yourself a certain amount of time to get to work, but it actually fluctuates quite massively. And there's a lot of things you can do to optimize that. And it, it has things like average pace and average kilometers per hour. And I kind of got into work and saw my results and thought, well, hey, I've, I've won. I've beaten against myself. And I thought, you know, when I got a best time, it was quite a success. I was really quite happy about that, and uh, I wanted to optimize more. So it's this kind of me versus me mentality. But I guess my logging on its own is fairly small and trivial because uh, when you've got an app like on the end of Mondo, 
all you're really doing is kind of timing yourself to work. Um, that's all I was doing crudely, which I could have done with a stopwatch really. So it's not really that big a deal. I mean, it logs it, which is nice. Uh, it gives you an average time. But with something like Strava, it gets a lot more complex and um, it's a lot more integrated into what kind of hardcore cyclists actually do. So Strava is an app that um, is probably going to build up to 10 million active users next year. So pretty massive. Um, it basically, you know, grab a GPS device, you can use iPhone, you can use a Garmin device, uh, go for a run or ride, and then you can view your activities on the website. So this is a um, typical Saturday heat map of the UK for Strava. Um, so you kind of see um, around London, southwest London, the Olympic route and the Surrey Hills, and then in the lowlands there, in the Netherlands, um, a lot of activity there. And it's, it's actually a California-based app. Um, but uh, most of the usage on the Saturday heat map is actually in the UK, so it sort of really shows the growth of cycling in this country. And there's all sorts of things that you can measure with it. I don't know if you can see these very well, but um, if you think of my kind of pithy data that I was, I was tracking, basically my time to work, how fast I was going, that's kind of crude when you, when you do the kind of premium subscriptions to Strava, which is things like progress goals, time and distance, that's, that's a given, it's basically a pedometer. But then there's things like leaderboards by filters by age and weight. So if I'm a 43 overweight guy, I don't want to be competing against you know, some young whippet. So it kind of creates a community and, and more competition within certain bands. And there's also things like detailed pace and power analysis it can tell um, from using a heart rate monitor as well. So there's a lot more data that Strava can crunch and I think my data, all this combines, and there's 10 million other people, and it's, uh, well, we're into kind of big data territory. And so from my kind of trivial mouse, we're into something much bigger. And it's very easy to kind of think of da big data as like this kind of big buzzword. It's probably the big buzzword of the year. Um, but I really recommend this book uh, from Victor Mayer Schoenberg, the uh, data editor to The Economist. It really is excellent at telling you about um, loads and loads of really rich examples about how data, big data works. Um, for instance, uh, Target the retailer in America is able to tell from the transaction purchases of people when they're pregnant. And uh, there's an example of a teenage girl being sent um, vouchers for her newborn baby. And she was, it was an underage pregnancy and her father was like, she can't be pregnant. But Target had actually kind of predicted it um, through the amount of data that they had on her. So I've talked about the fitness data that, through these kind of apps. Um, but there's also much more we can measure, of course. And I just want to kind of go into kind of more personal analytics and things like work-life productivity. So there's a blog post by uh, Stephen Wolfram, who's a British mathematician, called The Personal Analytics of My Life. And uh, he certainly loves a bit of life logging because he's uh, measured every electronic communication um, that he's put out since 1990. So you can see there on the left um, the daily amount of outgoing emails. Uh, and by 2006, he's actually sent uh, 250 a day. I don't know how he quite measure, manages that. And then on the uh, right-hand side, the amount he's on the phone. So an incredible amount of kind of life logging. What you can do with that, of course, is when, when you're kind of able to analyze when you're on the phone, you might also be able to analyze when you're most productive at work. Um, do you send too many emails, that sort of stuff. And if you've had this in a dashboard, it might tell you when your most effective times at work actually are. And going further than that, Wolfram Alpha, um, the computational knowledge engine that uh, Stephen Wolfram's built, uh, you can go on there and type in Facebook report, and you get a report of uh, basically all your activities on Facebook. You just kind of log in using the normal uh, Facebook login method. And it's quite an interesting way that you could think of the quantification of your social life, uh, because you can see through that report like who has interacted with you the most on Facebook, and you wouldn't otherwise really know that unless you kind of went into every single post and looked at that. And I suppose there, there's about, uh, you know, there's a lot of people on Facebook who interact with me quite a lot. I looked at the list of who interacted with me the most and I was like, these aren't really my friends. And so there's a kind of weirdness around this um, using applications for, you know, to measure social interactivity in your social life. Because my best friend doesn't really use social media that much, and this might tell me something completely different. And it's much the same with um, these apps, uh, Clout, Peer Index, and Cred particularly, and even Twitter, which are social inference measurers. But you could, you could see them in the, in the context of this quantified self as well, because they're basically trying to quantify your influence. So Clout takes um, data from a number of different sources, well, all of these different sources on the web, 
such as Facebook, Twitter, um, all of the social things it can basically get its uh, mitts on, and then kind of crunches them together to give you a score on influence out of 100. And even Twitter, you would say, is a kind of self quantification about influence because um, it's basically how influential you are by the number of followers you've got. And in the last uh, American presidential election, both Mitt Romney and Barack Obama were clearly guilty of buying fake followers just to kind of inflate the way that they look uh, influentially. So there's, the, there's those two things you know, around social media that measure influence, but of course it's only really for social media power users. Uh, if you think that back in about 2009, 2010, when Clout, Clout had really started, Justin Bieber was actually more influential, according to the app, than President Barack Obama. Um, they fixed that obvious flaw in the algorithm, but it goes to show, you know, if you're really active online, that doesn't necessarily mean you are actually that influential offline. Of course, it depends on the relativity, because if you're a teenage girl, maybe Justin Bieber is uh, slightly more influential. But if we go beyond just social media or one particular app, then if we look into our phones, then it can track where you're going, who you've interacted with, how long you've spoken to friends on a phone call, uh, the affinity of connections, how long it takes you to get to work, the tone of your messages, do you swear a lot, what's the sentiment of your text messages, um, the amount you text, tweet or update, uh, how much exercise you're getting, you know, are you moving quickly with your phone, and how much you get distracted. And all of these together can actually track how you're feeling if you, you can make an app that can actually do that. And it's, it's proven because on uh, the BBC uh, Horizon Monitor Me with um, Dr. Kevin Fong, he interviews Alex Sandy Pentland uh, from the MIT Media Lab, and he has this application that measures all these different things by, uh, that D Dr. Kevin Fong is doing. Jesus, that's loud. <laughs> um, so Dr. Fong is um, doing, and it gives him kind of scores like uh, 6 out of 10 for focus. Um, and he's saying, like, focus, what does that mean? It's like, well, you get this score based on how much you get distracted. Do you stay on one thing for a long time or not? Or, and there's another one, um, this kind of interactivity, or are you out of the house? If you're curled up in a ball somewhere, for instance, that's a kind of sign that you're not very active and that you might be depressed. And in testing this, they found it was actually pretty good against doctors, you know, of diagnosing depression and, and problems in um, personality. And then on top of this, um, you can also see, we're kind of going back to the big data argument and things like that, the, the, that Google can actually track flu in real time in the United States. So for about a decade of computational learning and massive machine learning through its algorithms, it's able to kind of narrow it down to about 43 search terms in real time in America, the kind of spread of flu. And if you go to google.org forward slash flu trends, you can actually see um, the, these trends in real time and across the world, and dengue fever as well. Um, and Google's a really interesting company because not only does it have so much data on it, it's also you know, really in mobile hardware. Um, Android is also the biggest um, handset software in the world, and it owns Motorola, so it's obviously got a massive slice of the mobile pie, but also Google Glass and the kind of birth of mainstream augmented reality might be a real game changer because I don't know if Google Glass will necessarily take off, um, in the next year, but it was certainly probably the start of a wave. And I just kind of imagine myself walking down High Holborn, like wearing either contact lenses or something like that, and looking at someone, and it might tell me scores or certain things about them if they subscribe to certain apps. So if you opted in for clout, for instance, and you want to walk around a bar showing your influence score, if you're particularly narcissistic, then I might be able to see that in a bar. Um, it might sound strange to you, but I really think this is, you know, future thinking. And then on top of that, when we've got augmented reality and the quantified self, there's also going to be 75 billion devices connected to the internet by 2020 through the Internet of Things. So not only can we measure things like your health, your interactivity with people, where you are, um, it's also you know, how many cups of tea do you make, that can be logged into a database. Uh, but of course we're in massive danger of app overload with all these different things. If uh, there's going to be one in t um, 10 devices for every one person on the planet connected to the internet, um, that's a lot of different applications that everyone has to manage. And we can, do, we can kind of manage it through using dashboarding, and um, if you're really interested in measuring a lot of things about yourself, then I really recommend using ChickTrack, which is um, a, a sort of a da dashboarding it, um, application. I can imagine that people might have this on the wall one day above the fireplace. Um, and they can, you can track all sorts of different APIs, like even cloud scores in there, but it's things like sleep, 
how heavy you are, maybe your blood pressure. Um, but the problem is, with this kind of proliferation of apps, you kind of have to pick one uh, if you're really going to make a splash in the community. And I, I spoke to a friend about it, and he was very heavily into Night Plus. I, can't, I kind of felt like it owned him. He couldn't really get out of it because he'd use it so much um, that he'd logged a couple of, a couple of thousand miles um, of running, and he was getting free stuff for it and things like that and discounts. And he was like, well, I know that Fitbit's kind of better, but why should I move? So you're kind of like locked in once you get started, unless you want to like spend loads of times updating loads of different apps. So it could feel a bit creepy to a lot of people, and you know, it's a kind of big brother notion about it, and we could swap that around with uh, and just say big data. But if you think about Google, it knows where I work and where I live, and every day at about 5.30, it gives me a little buzz and shows me two little cars and says ETA to home, 44 minutes. I don't ever remember opting into that service, uh, but it just does it anyway. And I was, uh, the finance director at work came up to me and said, um, yeah, I get this as well. I'm pretty creeped out about it. And I was like, well, it's not that creepy. I guess it's logical uh, if you put your GPS on. And I think a lot, a lot of people over 35, particularly the mainstream media, get really creeped out by kind of social media and um, the invasion of privacy. If you look at reports on Facebook, for instance, uh, every other report in the paper is either how big it is or basically how it's an invasion of um, personal privacy. And there's an interesting quote, um, I saw this on ICI.com uh, by Fujitsu the other day, um, from Harper Reid, who was CTO of Barack Obama's re-election campaign, so a kind of big data specialist. And he said, for anyone, anyone under 25, for the most part, has the same views and privacy, data, and trust, which is that they don't really care. And I think a lot of people get kind of wound up by the fact that, um, you know, that, that private... That, that, people could possibly access your private data. But a lot of people on social media, from my age below, I'm 28, I was one of the first people on um, Facebook in the UK because York was one of the earliest people to have it, New York University. I just don't really care that I've got this sort of stuff up. You know, if someone really wanted to go out and write a bad story about me, they could. But I kind of think, why would they bother unless I was really famous? You know, if I wanted to become a politician, then I'd probably clean up my act. But most people are kind of very passive about what they put on social media. Um, half the photos, I think, of all of my friends is when they're drunk. Um, so they're not actually too bothered what they put up. I guess the main message is for the under 25s is that we don't be creepy. And I think Google uh, kind of treads on that line when you don't really opt into services and it's telling you um, how long it is to get home. And certainly it creeps out my finance director. So where are we really going with this? So talked about um, fitness apps and social influence and basically all the stuff that you can record on your phone. But then if you, can think, if you think that you can measure basically your physical performance and things like that and then also potentially your mental performance or um, how you're feeling, there's a good quote by uh, Larry Smarr in that BBC uh, documentary, Monitor Me. It says we're at day zero in a whole new world of medicine. And Larry Smarr is one of the kind of uh, creators of the early internet actually and one of the most kind of quantified people in the world. On that documentary he even freezes his poo and sends them in a lab to be quantified. That's probably a bit overkill but uh, he is really excited by this because he managed to actually diagnose himself effectively with Crohn's disease which is a life-threatening illness very early on and, and find a cure early. And it's, it's kind of strange to imagine that you might be able to take a blood sample at home and it might be able to spot the early starts. Um, early signs of cancer, for instance. So this is an actual possibility. Um, and those apps, even they do actually exist now. So did anyone see this cover from Time magazine? <laughs> Can Google solve death? So uh, Google has actually set up a company called uh, Calico. Um, it's completely backed that company. It's a company that's um, in the interest of solving the human problem of aging. And uh, obviously, aging uh, costs a lot of people a lot of money. A lot of people have to go to retirement homes and things like that. And Google's kind of saying we can add a huge amount of time to the human lifespan. I think who better to do it than Google in a way because they have so much data on us and they understand machine learning so well. So uh, this is Jean Calmont. Uh, she was born in 1875. Uh, at 85, she took up fencing. Uh, she cycled until she was 100 years old. Uh, she smoked until she was 117, and she was 121 and 164 days when she died. I really think 
we're on the kind of crest of this wave, and it might be a lot of hyperbole, but that's the oldest person ever. I really think this kind of machine learning, big data, and all this quantification that is going into our mobiles, that it starts small and it gets really big, and we're going to improve the human lifespan in the next 20 years. Okay, so this is a bit heavy. Uh, I've kind of said, uh, you know, it's going to be completely life-changing. Everyone's going to live to 120. Uh, so let's get back to reality uh, and just go back to the, the fitness apps and um, just do a, a kind of quick run-through of how to make a good app. And then I've got to confess, it's slightly nicked from a, a blog from Ivan Kirigin, a developer uh, who's written about personal analytics and kind of six tips um, of how to make a great app. So the first thing is to grab everything you can with an API and everything that is kind of relevant to your app, you need to kind of get a hold of. So Strava would be pretty rubbish if it couldn't have um, access to your geolocation services, for instance. And um, with a lot of these kind of self-quantification apps, they really improve the more kind of data things that you can get hold of. So if you could get your uh, social logins, for instance, email, even things like SMS, if you were creating a social app, then that's probably going to improve that machine learning of it. Next is to make data entry e easy. I think one of the most frustrating things around the quantified self at the minute is that it takes quite a lot of input, particularly things like um, of, uh, photography, that's the one, that like gamified website. I kind of felt like when I went to the gym, I had to fill out a form for like half an hour. It's like, it's not really that fun. Um, much better to have a kind of mobile app which you can input into uh, fields really quickly. He says, if you have to type, you've already gone too far. So make data entry really easy. Uh, make it mobile, that's almost a complete given now. Uh, I think uh, apps like Tinder, for instance, are quite amazing in, fa in that um, that's basically hot or not um, from the 90s, but now we've got it on mobile with geolocation and it's also all of a sudden the kind of app of the moment. Uh, and next, emphasize insight over visualization. So uh, we can get kind of obsessed with graphs in this quantification and look at our performance over time. Um, but it's quite easy to cock them up. I think uh, Clout was a really good example of this because when you use social media, your score kind of just went up. Um, just, it just felt quite random. And then if you went on holiday, for instance, it kind of plummeted. That doesn't really give you any insight. It just says the more that you use social media, the more influential you are. It's, like, it's not really true, is it? Because if I took a two-month break, um, I probably would be still as influential, I would hope. So emphasize insight over visualization, and that's through things like offering more advice rather than just going for graphs all the time. And then basically if you're in this space, then machine learning is vital. You're in the machine learning business. Um, not only is UI important, but the kind of grabbing of data in APIs um, and adding more to that, and then also making algorithms to kind of machine learn is absolutely vital. And then finally, what Ivan Kirigan says is, um, building up a social support network and kind of making this competition between friends through apps is a kind of vital thing. And, and a kind of interesting story about Hotmail uh, when it was kind of first going around in the 90s is it didn't have that message at the bottom, want to free a free email account, so sign up for Hotmail today. And as soon as they put that on there, it kind of went viral because people were kind of telling their friends and when they, well, when they sent it to people, it had that message on and people immediately signed up. So make it really easy to kind of invite friends. I think Dropbox is another really good example. You get a lot of free space, for instance, if you sign other people up. And I think the seventh, which I haven't made a slide for, is that at the moment most of these apps are kind of made by data scientists and people that understand UI. But there's no real feed of content in there to, as to how to improve. So a fitness application that actually has some fitness advice kind of combined in it, I think there's a kind of... There's a gap in the market, but it's a seriously complicated thing to kind of uh, undertake. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, this talk uh, lasted 28 minutes and 35 seconds. Actually, 28.09. Uh, there were 51 slides in this deck. Uh, it included 267 words of copy, and my heart rate is probably around 105 BPM. Thanks.